Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series has an interesting name, The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. Everlasting. That would be a long time, right? And this lesson is entitled, Abraham's Seed. It's lesson number six in our series for May 8th of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, once again, we have the privilege of opening your word, talking about the things you have revealed that tell us such wonderful things about you and about your character and your government. Be with us now as we think through these things that we may uh, give thanks to you each day in our lives and in our actions and in our praise about you to others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We know that Israel was placed in that, what we might call a land bridge. You know, there's Europe and there's Asia and there's Africa right there in that critical center spot. Where does God put his people? There they are, land of Palestine, land of Canaan. Well, didn't he know what was going to happen? Surely he did. It certainly was God's plan for them to be a light to all the nations in every direction, but Israel failed its job. However, we must recognize that all through history there have been a few faithful. Think of Elijah, Elisha, Samuel, Daniel, and his three friends, and we could also mention others, uh, Joseph, yes. you know? Think about him and down through the ages. How about Elijah's and 7,000 who yeah. never bowed down? Yep. How was it that those people stood out? What, 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 what made them stand out from the crowd? What was their relationship to God that made them so different? And what were the attractions that led all the other people to fall into terrible sins? Stop worshiping God and worship idols. I mean, why? I mean, here's a chunk of metal. Let's bow down to it. I mean, hmm? I mean, did any of the kids ever ask their mom and dad, why are we bowing down to this chunk of metal? Well, they, they got, he cuts the tree down and half he warms his body and half he cooks his meal and, yes. and, and, and bow, bows down and says, oh, thank you for doing this thing for me. Over in the scriptures, though, if I could take a... Yeah. Um, after they crossed the Jordan River, it says, okay, gather the stones and your children will ask you. Yes. Tell us about. Yeah. This yeah. is the Lord himself saying. Yeah. Your children and teach them. Mm -hmm. Jim. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 7, 6. What was God's plan? Do this because you belong to the Lord your God. From all the peoples on earth, he chose you to be his own special people. American Bible Society. Okay, the Hebrew word segula can mean valued property or a peculiar treasure. The important point to remember is that God chose them. Was there any special reason why God should have chosen them? Well, it was Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9. That tells uh, the first thing right after the, after the flood there with Abraham when God separated the nations. He did it, did it according to the sons of God. Yeah. But Jacob, or Abraham, it was his special portion. Yeah. And that's how God was going to communicate this message to well, the rest of the world. Was God just trying to be faithful to his promise to Abraham? That why he chose them. Is it possible? I want you to think seriously, seriously about this. Think about the history of the Abraham's descendants from that day until this. Is it possible that God chose the Hebrews because he knew in advance that they would exhibit all the good as well as all the bad things with their corresponding results that needed to be seen and recognized by the onlooking universe. Is it possible that God says, okay, good and bad, bam, there it is. This has been said, how odd of God to choose the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of passages in the prophets talking about God's choice of his people. Look, for example, at Ezekiel 16, 8. Charles? As I passed by again, I saw 
that the time had come for you to fall in love. I covered your naked body with my coat and promised to love you. Yes, I made a marriage covenant with you and you became mine. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Good news scripture. Bible. Now I, hmm. Can you imagine God saying that to you? Or you're a prophet and saying something like that to you. <laughs> wow. Why was Israel chosen by Yahweh? That was in, in, inscrutable. inscrutable. Yeah, she was a small group of people without great culture or prestige. She possessed no special personal qualities which would warrant such a choice. The election was the act of God alone. The ultimate cause for the choice lay in the mystery of divine love. Yet the fact is that God did love Israel and did choose her, thereby honoring his promise to the fathers. She had been chosen in virtue of Yahweh's love for her. She had been liberated from slavery in Egypt by a display of Yahweh's power. Let her once grasp these great facts and she would realize that she was indeed a holy and special treasure people. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. We know from the scriptures the, the, the sequence, Adam and Noah and Abraham and, you know, Moses and well, Joseph and Moses and so forth like that. Do you think there were other nations where there were people like that in sequence that we just don't know about? It's a be. one I've struggled with. Yeah, it could be. Well, Midianite, what was the Zithro? Yeah. You know, um, there were some. There were some. The, 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 okay, the, the three wise men of the East. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they saw what uh, Jews mm -hmm. would not look at. What was that? Any tendency on her part? Let her once grasp at the top. I moved it up. Okay, where are we? Uh, second line. Second line, okay. Let her grasp these great facts and she would realize that she was indeed a holy and especially treasured people. Any tendency on her part, therefore, to surrender such a noble status was reprehensible in the extreme. That's a commentary Thompson. by J. A. Thompson. Right. Yeah. Think about that. If you, if you knew God had chosen you for all kinds of special privileges, you say, no, I'm, 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 I don't want that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bow down to a golden idol. I mean, you know. Who says, how can, did we, anyone give up, how can we give up such great a salvation? I think it was, was it Paul somewhere? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, how could they do this? Yeah. Israel was, to, was chosen to be a law, ro royal and priestly race. What did God intend for, by using those words? How were they interpreted by the Hebrew people themselves? You ever asked yourself that question? Hmm. They were supposed to be kings, moral and spiritual. And they were supposed to spread the good news of God's wonderful grace and blessings to all around them. They were to be instructors, preachers, and prophets. Furthermore, they were to live the kind of lives that would shine as lights. Remember we read last week, Abraham had a great influence because of what? The kind of life he lived, right? Yes. Yeah. And you, you look down through history. Joseph, think, think of other people. And Daniel. Why, why did he end up being prime minister for two of the world empires? Because of the way he lived. In the he, because of the choice. If, if Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. Yep. He made the choice as a young man, very, uh, and he probably lost his parents. Yeah. But he chose to follow. So why did God call them to be above all people of the earth? Daniel's, I mean, Deuteronomy 7, 6. Wasn't that a bit of an invitation for them to be egocentric and self-centered? <laughs> <laughs> if you knew that it was God, having done all those things for you, and then calling you, okay, 
I'm blessing you with all these blessings, please. Would you say, well, no, I don't want to bother. Too much trouble. Do we as a Seventh-day Adventist church believe that God has chosen us for special privileges? Or maybe a special task? Are there certain privileges connected with that special task? Have we become lights to the whole world? The question is for you out there as well. As one reads through the Old Testament, it becomes very clear that Israel wanted to claim all the promises and privileges that God had given without meeting any of the conditions. Carrie? Genesis 35, verse 12. I will give you the land which I gave to you Abraham and to Isaac, and I will also give it to your descendants after you. The Good News Bible. And we know that that promise was repeated to Isaac. It was later repeated to Jacob and his sons. The book of Deuteronomy consists of three fairly lengthy sermons, or lectures, if you will, whatever you want to call them, that Moses gave to the children of Israel just before he left them. And where did he go? They were camped on the floodplain at the foot of the territory of Moab, looking across a flooded valley to the city of Jericho. And where did Moses go? He turned around and looked back and climbed the mountains up to the very top. It was just, it's a, it, those hills are pretty steep. He got to the top and God laid him down and let him die and raised him up a short time later. Anyway, Deuteronomy 28 summarizes the conditions that they were supposed to meet in order to receive all the blessings God had promised. Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 15. I'm just, we're going to just, just, we don't have time to re read all of it. We're going to pick out a few verses. Verse 1. If you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, he will make you greater than any other nation on earth. And then verse 15. But if you disobey the Lord your God and do not faithfully keep all his commands and laws that I'm giving you today, all these evil things will happen to you. That fills the statement that all the promises and threatenings of God are alike conditional. conditional. Yep. If one reads the entire chapter of Deuteronomy 28, we're going we're gonna to touch it again in a moment, one would think that disobeying God would be unthinkable. One should be scared to death. But is it possible, I'm going to ask you this, and I'm going to ask all of you out there, is it possible to scare people into being good? Nope. I've heard someone, over time. I've heard people say it like this before, can you scare the hell out of people? <laughs> 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 Meaning literally. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but God wasn't talking directly to the people. He was no. going through Moses, priest, Moses and, the, and, and the priesthood yeah. there. So... Uh, uh, well, listen to what it says coming up. Why did God use that horrendous language to warn them? Notice, of course, that the first 14 verses of Deuteronomy 28 are wonderful promises if they would be obedient. But the rest of the chapter is full of terrible curses. Look, look especially at these verses. Deuteronomy 28, 53 to 57. When your enemies are besieging your towns, you will become so desperate for food that you will even eat the children that the Lord your God has given you. Wow. Even the most refined men of noble birth will become so desperate during the siege that he will eat some of his own children because he has no other food. He will not even give any to his brother or to the, his, or to the wife he loves or to any children of his... To give you, or any of his children who are left. Even the most refined wimp, woman of noble birth, so rich that she has never had to walk anywhere, shall behave in the same way. Let me interrupt for a second. <clears throat> Can you imagine saying, uh, I've just cooked brother, would you like a bite? Mm. Ghastly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, that, that's what we're talking about here. When the enemy besieges her town, she will become so desperate for food that she will secretly eat her newborn child and the afterbirth as well. 
She will not share them with the husband she loves or with any of her children. Wow. Man, it gets worse. Yes. These curses are largely, though not wholly, brought about by simply giving sin scope to the world no, to work, to out. work out the its own evil results. He has excuse me, he that soweth to his flesh shall of no flesh reap corruption. Shall of the flesh. Shall of the flesh reap reach corruption. Galatians reap, six reap eight. Yeah. Okay, wow, that's in our adult Sabbath school Bible yeah, uh, lessons for, one, for Monday. One minute. Uh, yeah. This is uh, Deuteronomy 28. Yes. This is uh, Moses, Moses is, is still alive. Fa farewell message to the Moses people. Moses' farewell message. And he's saying, look, this, this will happen if yes. you leave the Lord. And yet they left the Lord. And they did exactly what Moses said. Yep, it happened. Jeremiah talks about it. Ezekiel talks about it. Yeah. Well, when when Kings Solomon, and Chronicles, when the wisest king, wisest man on earth, sacrificed his own son. Yep. Uh, what else do we exploit? Well, when who's the uh, Emma, uh, No, Hezekiah's dad. He has. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, before if I may very quickly make a comment. Uh, or then they come back from the exile and the pendulum swings and they have so many laws how many 400 some laws so they, they make these laws God himself yep salvation itself you know mm -hmm. and forget the forget the lawgiver yeah. you just shake your head when God makes promises to a group of people does he indicate that those promises must apply only to that group and not to any others? Or are God's promises intended to be for any who comply with the conditions? Mm. Yes, of course it some of these to. Some of these promises from ancient times, could they still apply to us? Yes. Before we eat our children? <laughs> wow, it's, it's hard to even imagine that. I mean, you just... I'm thinking of the good promises. Of yeah. course, they apply to us, right? We are Abraham's children. Yep. But then these bad ones, yeah, who knows what will happen. Carrie? Yes. <laughs> Chapter 26 of Leviticus. And we're using verses 27 through 33. I'm going to interrupt for a second again. <clears throat> I'm doing a lot of interrupting here today. Do you know when Leviticus was written? You said it last time. I know it. I'll never forget that one. <laughs> <laughs> one month, in one month's time, this was written right there at the foot of Mount Sinai. As they are build, getting ready to build the, the, the tent, the tabernacle there, and God says, I'm giving you all these instructions. So look at, this is, they, God, they have just seen God on top of the mountain. The whole mountain is shook. They have been down with their faces in the dirt saying, God, whatever you say, we three times, them. whatever you say, we'll do it. And then 40 days later, they're dancing quick drunk. Question. So is this within these 40 days or is it after they fell on their face and they were naked worshiping? That's I don't hard. know. This, no, this is... But this is the time though. Yeah, this yeah. Time okay, time. this is the context. Go ahead, Kerry. Okay, uh, I'll start again, I think. If after all of this you still continue to defy me and refuse to obey me, then in my anger I will turn on you and again make your punishment seven times worse than before. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt again. Deuteronomy and basically the books of Moses are written in a way that you would think anything that's sort of beyond human power, anything that's unexpected or strange or something like that, you can't explain how it happened, it's automatically attributed to God. There's, you, don't, you don't read about the great controversy in, in the book of writings of Moses. Everything that happens there, God did it. So here we see that kind of language being spoken. Go ahead. Your hunger will be so great that you will eat your own children. 
I will destroy your places of worship on the hills, tear down your incense altars, and throw your dead bodies on your fallen idols. <laughs> Think about that. Here's your God. Somebody throws it down on the ground. It's trash. Your dead body gets thrown on top of it. In utter disgust, I will turn your cities into ruins, destroy your places of worship, and refuse to accept your sacrifices. Hmm. I will destroy your land so completely that the enemies who occupy it will be shocked at the destruction. I will bring war on you and scatter you in foreign lands. Your land will be deserted and your cities left in ruins. Wow. We as Seventh-day Adventist Christians look forward to the second coming of Jesus and a glorious home in heaven and eventually on a new earth. Those are wonderful promises, but are we meeting the conditions? We can look back at the children of Israel and lament their failings, but having seen the results spread out in the Old Testament, we know that Israel was not obedient. No. Jeremiah 11:8. But they did not listen or obey. Instead, everyone continued to be as stubborn and evil as ever. I had commanded them to keep the covenant, but they refused. So I brought on them all the punishments described in it. Good news Bible. In keeping what you said earlier, yeah. it could be said that I permitted yeah. these, uh, these things. Of they, course. That's okay. funny. I think that, that's a, one of the most important things. Just because the translators or whatever... Did, brought it out that way, we understand God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Mm -hmm. And based upon what you just said earlier, mm -hmm. the, the S SDI Bible commentary supports just what you said. How are we to understand those words? Does God bring punishment on the wicked? Or in light of the great controversy and Satan's constant demands for fairness, yeah, fairness, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. as if he cared about fairness. <laughs> Does God have to step back from those who refuse to follow his directions and allow Satan to have control of them? Could that be described as God's punishing them or God killing them even, if that's what the results are? Think back to Noah. We've already discussed him, but he and his family had to build a boat and get on, uh, and get on if they wanted to be saved. All the evil in our world begins with thoughts in someone's mind. God, did, God in his foreknowledge knew there was a flood coming and he provided protection yep. yes. for those. In his foreknowledge, he knew he didn't need a bigger boat. No. <laughs> Sadly. No. Yeah. But that boat was pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what but, I'm trying to say is it yeah. was sufficient for the, for right, the family but, that got yeah. on there. Uh, yeah. Whoever wanted to, they could. Yeah. Right, right. Yes. Genesis 6-5. When the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time. So where does, goodness Bible. Yeah, where does the evil come from? From the mind. <laughs> right there, someone's thoughts. As we noted earlier, God had promised the children of Israel that they would rule the land from Egypt to the Euphrates. Only briefly under David in the early years of Solomon was that promised, promised territory under their control. So how did God describe his relationship with Israel later in their history? Carrie? Using Jeremiah 3, verses 1 and 20, the Lord says, if a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and becomes another man's wife, he cannot take her back again. This would completely defile the land. But Israel, you have had many lovers, and now you want to return to me? <laughs> and like an unfaithful wife, you have not been faithful to me. I, the Lord, have spoken. So what's the context? Remember, we're, we're talking here Jeremiah. What's happening in Jeremiah? The, the, they're about ready to be conquered by Nebuchadnezzar the third time. The, most of the children of Israel have already been taken off into Babylonia to serve as, as slaves over there, do whatever, the, whatever the, the kings wanted them to do over there. Jeremiah is left in Jerusalem with a relatively few people left, and they're saying, Whoa, what's, uh, God, please, quick, do something. And God's, hold on to a minute. Who, who, 
who did you, who are you praying to? Let them help you, right? I think Hosea and Jeremiah were about the same time. When well, I, I oh, see oh, that name there. Yeah, no, Hosea was a little bit earlier. earlier. But, but yeah. same thoughts, though. Yeah, same well, uh, Hosea was talking to the northern kingdom at their downfall, and Jeremiah is now talking to the southern kingdom at their downfall. So, same situation, but a little bit different time. Okay, it, it, I'll just pick your brain a little bit. Hosea was for the northern kingdom. There was someone else also for the northern kingdom. Well, the, in, in the northern kingdom, we had Hosea, right. Micah, Isaiah, and Amos. So, so the two... It, uh, Hosea and Amos spoke to the northern kingdom at that same time that Micah and Isaiah were speaking to the southern kingdom. That was the, the days of Isaiah, those four. So Isaiah, was he involved in the northern kingdom too? No, but he, but he, you know, he was in the southern, southern kingdom. kingdom right. So the southern kingdom prophets were Isaiah and Micah. Okay. Right. At that same time, the northern kingdom prophets were Amos, Amos and Hosea. And Hosea right. Amos actually came from the south, but he traveled to the north to, to prophesy to them. Yeah, and he stayed there. Yeah. Right. right. They tried to kick him out, but he yeah. said, I'm, I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elijah was uh, up north too then, wasn't he? Yeah, but that was even earlier. earlier. That was earlier. that was earlier, uh, 100 years earlier. Yeah. yeah. Well, then he ends up running away from Jezebel after yeah. having it saw that great display. Yeah. A number of Old Testament prophets, including Isaiah and Hosea and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others, implied that God wants us to be his beloved bride, even to be in a relationship with him as close as that of a husband and wife. This is not just some kind of business agreement. It is a very personal mm -hmm. relationship. Thus, when Israel broke that relationship with God, it was not just a breaking of some kind of business proposition. It was like breaking up a marriage. So how do you feel about your relationship with God? Is that commitment as deep and abiding and meaningful as a good marriage relationship? God was always looking out for them despite Israel's repeated rebellions and going off and worshiping idols and then when disaster struck, trying to come back. I mean, think about the story of the, of, of the judges. Up and down. They get, they get overrun by their enemies. Oh, God, please help us. Okay, come back. Okay, good. We worship him for a little while. Then, down. Oh, oh, God, we ran away. <laughs> Just <laughs> craziness. Micah 4, 6, and 7. The timing is, time is coming. Now, remember, Micah was at the time of the fall of the northern kingdom. The time is coming, says the Lord, when I will gather together the people I punished, those who have suffered in exile. They are crippled and far from home, but I will make a new beginning with those who are left, and they will become a great nation. I will rule over them on Mount Zion from that time on and forever. Good news, Bible. Now that part that says forever, does that mean for as long as it lasts? Yes. Because there's no... But, but no. Northern Kingdom never materialized, though they they all dispersed all over. No, but so. that's what he's that what that's what God's saying here. When when the Southern Kingdom was allowed to return to Palestine mm -hmm. to reestablish their kingdom, the the call went out to to anybody of Jewish of of Hebrew descent anywhere in the world. If you want to return back, you can go back now. This is even even including the people if there were some faithful from the north. This is in the Old Testament. Yes. Still. Yes. Because New Testament is over. No, this is this is at the time when the the Jews went back from Babylon right. to to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right. But at that same Under time that Israel and Jeruba, Jerubabel, yeah. Well, yeah, and exactly. Nehemiah. But that if you look on you look at Ezra, where the decrees there are there from some from Cyrus. Right, right. And later from Darius, those decrees said, anyone who's a worshiper of the true God, if you want, you can now come but back. But then only a handful of people went back. Only a handful. One or two percent. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, Zephaniah 3, 12 and 13, I will leave there a humble and lowly people who will come to me for help. The people of Israel who survive will do no wrong to anyone, tell no lies, nor try to deceive. They will be prosperous and secure, afraid of no one. And when will that happen? When? I already gave it away. I'm, when I'm, did that happen? 
very quickly I'm gonna so when yeah, when this folk or zero bubble was still alive perhaps okay uh, when Ezra was still uh, Nehemiah they they followed the, the under the day, under in the forces. times of Ezra and Nehemiah they were pretty faithful yes and after that came all these crazy laws yeah we like the law not the lawgiver anymore yeah. and under this circumstance Christ was born after yeah. so many years so what groups do you think those prophets were talking about? Did each of God's Old Testament prophets know of some among the people of Israel or Judah who had remained faithful? Think of Daniel and his three friends growing up in that terrible apostasy that we read about in Jerusalem. How did they manage to continue to be so upright and faithful to God after coming from that environment? Prophets like Isaiah and Zechariah talked about God's plan for us and his ultimate hope. And um, I think, well, let, let me read Zechariah 14, 16. Then all the survivors from the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go there each year to worship the Lord Almighty as king and to celebrate the festival of shelters. Mm. All the nations that have attacked Israel. Israel. God has always had a few faithful ones. At times, as in the days of Noah, the number must have been very, very small. But God is always looking about after those faithful ones. Now, if you remember, we had passages, what was it, three or four weeks ago, we talked about uh, Abraham, I'm, I'm sorry, Noah had a number of faithful people who helped him build the ark. Yeah. And they either died, or, well, they, and, they, died. And they died before, before the, the flood came. I just wanted to bring out one person that we don't talk about very much, being faithful, but having tremendous impact, is this little girl, slave girl who probably lost her parents. She could be very bitter. Says, Naaman, hey, you have this problem, yeah. Syrian. Go back. You know, go back. And this is what a witness of a little girl. She's a slave. Wow. Can you think of another little orphaned girl who had a huge impact? Esther, probably. Esther, absolutely. Well, think about God's relationship with Elijah. Can you imagine yourself going through the experiences that Elijah went through? <laughs> Would you dare? I just love this. I, I, someday I want to see this in 3D living color. This hick guy with wearing a robe of camel's hair or something like that, woven really rough and a, piece, a leather belt around his waist or something like this, marches into the throne room. He marches right in. He doesn't stop to talk to the guards. He just, whoosh, there he is. He stands in front of the king and says, there's going to be no rain until I say so. Bye. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> you know, he just, he just... Oh, I, I, I'm sure everybody was, you know, they were, they were in a state of shock. Everybody was in, by the time they, <laughs> they recovered from their shock, he was gone. Who was that man? Yeah. Where did he come from? <laughs> well, well, you can read the whole story if you, don't, if you haven't done so recently. First Kings chapters 18 and 19. So what were the distinguishing characteristics of those few people? Uh, a few faithful people in contrast to the broad masses? John 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never die. No one can snatch them away from me. So who are they? The ones who are listening to God's voice, right? I, I, I need to, I think we should spend a little time on this so many Christian friends. Hey, I gave my life to God. I'm saved. I cannot be unsaved anymore. Yeah. And because he has promised, no one is going to take my, take you away from my hand. I, did, I can do whatever I want to, but yeah. I, this is such a false... Unfortunately, there have been many people down through generations who have looked at some unfaithful church members and said, I don't want to have anything to do with those people. What's wrong with that approach? We sometimes say that the church is a hospital for sinners and not a club for saints. So if you go to a hospital, where do the sickest patients go? I see you. <laughs> to, the, to the best hospitals. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. God's ultimate answer to that whole problem was sending his own son in New Testament times. And apostles like Paul spelled out in the New Testament as clearly as they could what God expects of us. 
Galatians 3:26 through 29 it is through faith that all of you are God's children in union with Christ Jesus you were baptized into union with Christ and now you are clothed so to speak with the life of Christ himself good news Bible I noticed that I extended the verse 29. It's only, it's only 20, 26 and 27 there. We'll look at the rest of it a little bit later. So what is it in the, that passage that is the key to a right relationship with God? The word we use to describe that right relationship with God is faith. And you know, you hear theologians arguing back and forth. They talk about justification by faith and they talk about sanctification by faith and propitiation by faith and, and glorification by faith. And what's the common word in all of that? Faith. Right. I mean, let's talk about the faith. Why, why, do, why try to break it up in tiny little pieces? Let's talk about the faith. Well, summarizing much of what the Bible and Ellen White have said on the subject, A. Graham Maxwell concluded, as he stated many times, Carrie? Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. In brackets here we've got we cannot say will be because we remember the story of Lucifer. So who knew God better than Lucifer back in the beginning? And yet what did he do? He rebelled. Mm. Yes. Okay. Uh, faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we are sure he is the one saying it. To accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. I'm going to interrupt for a second. <clears throat> there are a lot of people who think it's heresy to say safe to save. We are just saved by God's grace, and that's true. But do we have anything to do with it? Yeah, we're we saved. make choices. We're saved by a gracious God. We're saved by a gracious God. That's right. And it's, exactly. Uh, and uh, God wants to, he wants friends. Yeah. But how do you have friends if you don't spend some time listening and, and being educated? Yep. Go ahead, Kerry. Faith also means that like Abraham, and this is talking Genesis 18, 22 to 33, Job and Moses, Exodus, 32, 5, 14, Numbers 14, 11, 25. God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Okay. So what kind of people re ask re reverent questions to God? God's friends. God's friends. God's friends. By baptizing, baptism, we choose to align ourselves with the heritage of Abraham. We claim the rights and privileges offered by Jesus Christ through his life and death. Quoting now, the gift to Abraham and his seed included not merely the land of Canaan, but the whole earth. So says the apostle, the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13. And the Bible plainly teaches that the promises made to Abraham are to be fulfilled through Christ. Believers become heirs to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. 1 Peter 1.4. The earth freed from the curse of sin. Patriarchs and Prophets 169 and 170. That promise has never been fulfilled yet. But we have a glorious future to look forward to when it will be fulfilled. And that's specifically in lots of places, but for example, Daniel 7, verse 27. Why do you think it was so important in Paul's mind to make those very strong statements recorded in, Dan in Galatians 3, 28 and 29 about all human beings equal? I said we were going to get back to this. Go ahead. 
No, Let, actually, this is, this is a comment about it. Let me just read those verses. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Okay, Jim. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple courts, that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's influence those who have been deluded by his deceptions and places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, page 369. And we just a little note here. That promise of Abraham, that, that statement by Ellen White was first published in 1917 before women in this country could even vote. Mm. And that was after Ellen White had died because yes. it, it was... She was just finishing her book when she, she, she uh, pay, uh, Prophets and Kings, and when she died. Okay. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. Let's stop there a second here, yeah. back, okay? Now, if you will obey me, you could say, now if you will listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really what the word means. Word Unfortunately, word. it's because God wants to educate you, right. and he can't do that if you're not listening. That's right. Yeah. And that becomes, if you listen, you can become persuaded and and. Persuasion is, if you look at a, a dictionary for the word pistis, or however it is, the first one is persuasion. Then faith, belief, trust, and confidence, all it comes down the line. But the first one is, and how does it, God, he communicates through words yeah. uh, to persuade us. Get, you know, the couple of quotations we had earlier, it's all the demonstrations, all the evidences that he's given. I mean, it's, it's a, a great lesson here. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and God, God is just, well, you, you mentioned that obedience is, in Greek, the word is hupakoe, yeah. which means a humble willingness to listen. Mm. That's what obedience, so if you think about it, there's, there's two parts to obedience. We, we, we usually think, in, in modern times, we think obedience means you go and do it. But you don't go and do it until you're convinced, convinced that's the word. based on whatever, yes. that it's something you need to do. Right, right. So God says, I can't always prove, I can't always make it possible for you to do everything that you need to do, but I can make you, I can, I can help you listen if you're willing. Uh, the, the, the thief on the cross, I mean, how much time did he have to go out and witness to the truth, et cetera, et cetera? None whatsoever. But God said to him, what? You will be in the kingdom. In the kingdom. Yeah. So God focuses on the humble willingness to listen. He doesn't focus so much. We, we're expected to go out and, and live our faith. And faith works, as we sometimes so, say. Uh, and, and the, for a believer, uh, an individual, his uh, knowledge has to bring him to submission. Yeah. And from that submission is the obedience you know, that follows. Do we really believe, and I'll ask you out there, do you really believe that living the God style, if you will, is the happiest way to live? That's the question. Those must have been precious words to the faithful among Israel. And think about 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, where Peter just says, basically, those promises which were given to the children of Israel in old days, they're now, they're now available to everybody who, who wants to be faithful. 
Clearly, Peter felt free to take the application of the promise to the Israelite people given at the foot of Mount Sinai and apply it to all Christians down through time. When we study the Old Testament system, we realize that there were many, many sacrifices to be offered. Why don't we offer sacrifices like that today? That, Carrie, I believe that's yours? Okay, I was just thinking about that statement there. First Peter, no, yes, no it is. is. First, First Peter. Peter 2, 5, Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable, acceptable rather, sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ from the Good News Bible. And Romans 12, 1 and 2. So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God. Okay, let me interrupt there for a second. <clears throat> The free, previous verse says we are supposed to be as priests offering sacrifices, and now it says we're supposed to be living sacrifices. Can you think of someone else who was a priest and a sacrifice? Jesus Christ. Are we following his example? Okay, go ahead. Uh, the living sacrifice to God? Yeah, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him and is perfect. Okay. There's an important thing which we might have just slipped through there that we might not have noticed. Who does the changing? God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. We, we forget that. We have the option of giving God a chance. We can study His Word, we can think about Him, and when we do that, He has a chance of making a change in our lives. We are not the ones who change our lives. He is the one who has the power to change us. But as human beings, just like uh, King David, we fail and He helps us stand up again. Yep. There are many things we can learn from the history of the Israelites. God tried to set them apart using many different techniques to help them to realize that they were to be a light to the whole world. Mm -hmm. But all that God asks of us is that right relationship with Him that we call faith. faith. That, is a true, that is true now just as it was in the days of Moses. God finally decided to take that ultimate step and sent His only Son, to this earth as a human being to be born as a baby boy into the very heart of the enemy's territory to appeal to them and to us to return to a right relationship with him. Through the life and death of Jesus, we must learn many lessons. So why have human beings down through the generations found it so difficult to establish such a loving, trusting relationship with our dear friend, with our divine friend? Deuteronomy 440, Obey all his laws that I have given you today, and all will go well with you and your descendants. You will continue to live in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to be yours forever. Isaiah 119, The Lord said, If you'll only obey me, you'll eat the good things that the land produces. So what's the problem? Why do people have a hard time? There's the promises. What's, what's the difficulty? We don't want to do it. We, well, we, we think it's too hard. For the whole world, it is. Uh, it has been nailed to the cross. No, yeah. really, truly. I mean, they have uh, just no. We don't need this law anymore. But he says, "Obey me." I'm just asking you to walk with me in faith. Yeah. It's. How do you feel about worshiping a God who says, "Obey me and live," or "Disobey me and die"? Okay. Or substitute the word listen. Yeah. Listen, I have good uh, things for good. you to, to learn. But if you don't want to listen... Is that a good way to get people to love you? Have you ever wondered how the angels who are gathered around the throne of God in heaven view our experiences? 
What do you think of the whole history of the Bible? What do they think of the whole history of the Bible? What do they think of us? Amazing as it might seem, God is still looking for a faithful group of people to finish the gospel. Yes. He provides us the Holy Spirit to work with us. I mean, do you need any help? How about the Holy Spirit? Mm. <laughs> you know? Look at Joel 2, 32. But all who ask the, excuse me, ask the Lord for help will be saved. As the Lord has said, some in Jerusalem will escape. Those who I choose will survive. Zephaniah 3, 12 and 13. I will leave there a humble and lowly people who will come to me for help. The people of Israel who survive will be no will do. Me, will do no wrong to anyone, tell no lies, nor try to deceive. They will be prosperous and secure, afraid of no one. Good News Bible. And you could put in there Jeremiah 31, the, the New Covenant, 31 and 34, and Ezekiel 11, 16 to 21, which is basically the same thing. Why do you think God mixes up those wonderful promises with what appear to be threats? Is it, maybe, maybe it'd be regular, reckon, excuse me, recognize it, it is just a warning, yeah. uh, rather than a threat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so. what he requires of us is that irrational. The laws, his laws. It's not at all, it's a, it's a human relationship, so what's yeah. the problem? Yeah. But and you do this and walk with me. Unfortunately, they re look at it as it's a, a command or an order rather than a description of the way for eternity. Mm -hmm. right. right. Well, those prophets had some wonderful things to say. Zechariah 9, 7. Yes, they will no longer eat meat with blood in it. In other forbidden food or other forbidden food, all the survivors will become part of my people and will be like a clan in the tribe of Judah. Ekron will become part of my people as the Jebusites did. Okay. Zechariah 14, 16. Then all the survivors from all the nations, <clears throat> all the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go there each year to worship the Lord Almighty as King and to celebrate the Festival of Shelters. Zechariah lived just a short time after they returned from Babylonian captivity. And when he said to them, all these nations who have attacked you will one day come and worship, and worship God in Jerusalem, who did they think about? The Assyrians. The Egyptians, Egyptians, the Babylonians. Yes. How well, how will God feel about all those people that he called to be his faithful followers, but who rebelled against him and who will be lost in the end? God never rejects any group en masse. Mm -hmm. How do you understand the words in Romans 3, 1 to 4? Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles, or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true, even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Who's being tried? God is being tried. He's God is being tried. What do we mean when we say God is being tried? God is asking every person here on planet Earth to look at the evidence and to decide, do we want to serve him or do we not want to serve him? God, we are collectively voting either for Satan or for God. Yes. That is a very profound statement. There are many who claim to be Bible scholars who believe that nothing that we do on this earth could impact God in any way. But notice Romans 3, 4 that we just read. What does that tell us? God has put his reputation on the line. We talked about it in our last lesson. In Job, in Abraham, at the cross. That's right. 
saying that he will be able to save a significant number of people in the final end because they have chosen to be faithful to him. Amen. God wins his case by providing the evidence in the form of saved and transformed lives. And in keeping with that is, it's God has attempted for all these millennia to persuade mm -hmm. his, the truth of his character and, and what he has to teach. Mm. Do the Jews in our day have any spiritual advantages? Do you ever wish that you could read the Old Testament in the original Hebrew? Or even the New Testament in the original Greek? Do those who can do so have an advantage? Well, there are some advantages to that. Isn't it, is it an advantage to be a literal, physical descendant of Abraham? If you say so, remember that millions and millions of Arab Muslims are also descendants of Abraham. God went way out of his way to try to impress the children of Israel that he wanted to be their friend. And we talk about that from the Gospel of John all the time. But look at Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Then the cloud covered the tent, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled it. Because of this, and this is, this is the dedication of that tent out there at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses could not go into the tent because of that. The Israelites moved their camp to another place only when the cloud lifted from the tent. As long as the cloud stayed there, they did not move their camp. During all their, long, their wanderings, they could see the cloud of the Lord's presence over the tent during the day and a fire giving them a night light above it during the night. This is Shekinah glory, God's very presence. Yes. Something similar happened in, with the dedication of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Mm. Think of the experience of Paul, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, who had at one time been a member of the Sanhedrin while he was still a young man, and yet later in his life he found himself being followed by Jewish Christians who believed that if one did not fully follow the Jewish rules, one could not be a Christian or be saved. Paul became so concerned with some of the churches began to believe these things that he wrote the following words to the church at Corinth, and I'm not going to have time to read all these words, but the experiences that Paul went there and, and read it in 2 Corinthians 11, 16 to 33, shipwrecks and beatings and, and uh, within a, a you know, stonings. He was stoned. Yes. All those things. And, 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 God, and Paul says, these people who claim to be real saints better than me, have they been in any of those things that happened to them? I, I, I just ask you, think about it. Who is it the person that really, really loves you, really cares about you? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these privileges we have to think about you, to talk about you, to allow you to enter our thoughts and our minds, to transform our characters. May that be our daily experience and the experience of those who listen in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.